Dr. Tom Siskron, how are you, sir? I'm good. Good to see you again. You too, man. So it's been it's been shoot probably a year and a half or so since we last sit down. I don't down. remember how long it's been. It's, it's been, been a while. Forever. It's been a while. Yeah. So so uh, honestly, just wanted to have you back on. There's been all these things that have been happening in my life and other people's lives, and see all this stuff. And and honestly, I just know you're kind of a connoisseur of um, pushing healthy living habits. Mm-hmm. Aside from being a urologist and you know that being your main focus, but also just. I know you're an active guy, and we talked about it last time, like you know, about all the functional fitness stuff and the health. And so, man, I just want to dive back into all that. Let's do it. So, I mean, what's on your mind lately? I mean, honestly, we're we're facing a lot of stuff every single day. I feel like people get more and more unhealthy as we move forward. And then there's so many healthy ideals that really aren't necessarily actually healthy that people are, are starting to live by and may have been living by for you know the past few years of their lives. I mean, well. Um, personally, I'll, I'll just start by saying that I think things evolve. I mean, my my philosophy is all, and it evolves with um, with where you are in your personal journey and your your injuries and fitness. I mean, lately I've been suffering with a little um, neck thing from I think back when I had whiplash in car wrecks and you know snowboarding accidents, and I got a big long neck anyway. So I've got a an impingement of my C six nerve that. I've got a tingling in my shoulder, and then I'll, about a month ago, I was just having excruciating pain in my neck. Couldn't sleep. I was sitting upright to sleep, and it's getting better, but it's changed how I do things. I mean, I'm having to, you know, I'm not working out as hard. I'm having to scale. I'm not going overhead as much. Right. But I'm still trying to maintain the muscle and finding ways to do that. You know, if you're not going to be pushing overhead, how are you going to keep your shoulders and, and everything strong? Yeah. So I'm modifying how I work out. Trying to stay healthy at the same time, trying to stay fit. My diet has modified, I think, since I saw you. Um, I, I still preach to patients just eat natural foods. But on a personal level, I've almost eliminated even vegetables from my diet. Really? I'm so more, more carnivore. Hey, I love it. I love it. I, yeah. I, I feel way better doing more carnivore. I still enjoy like a fruit for carb supplement. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But, I'll eat know. berries. I'll yeah. eat fruit occasionally. But, you know, all these other... The more I read and understand what the, the real research research says about plants, they're not our friends. They don't want us to eat them. Yeah, you know that. I, I read I read this um, article or a, maybe the book or an article. It's called "Plants Want to Kill You." <laughs> you know, okay. They they are they have developed defense mechanisms to prevent you from eating them. The only reason that we eat all of the stuff we eat in the grocery store nowadays is because we've bred it, crossbred it to where the toxins are tolerable. Yeah. Yeah. But there's still so many toxins in there that disrupt our gut, causing autoimmune problems. I mean, even broccoli. One of the things that amazed me is those little those little seed-like things at the, on the head of the broccoli. The you know They're made up of little bitty round balls. Yeah. There's two different chemicals in, in different of those little round capsules. Individually, they're fine, but when mixed, they form a toxin that's toxic to humans. Really? On a microscopic, on a micro level. Um, I don't remember what the toxin does, but I'm sure it's like a gastric or a GI toxic type system. But it's, it's, it's initiated by mastication, chewing. When those two capsules mix together by an animal chewing them, it creates a third compound that is toxic. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy. It's crazy how plants have right. evolved with their environment and the, and the stressors placed on them to yeah. evolve um, defenses. And some plants have toxins that are specific to only certain animals because those are the ones that used to eat them. So they developed toxins. Some animals are the only animals that can eat a certain plant, like koalas. You find me another animal that can eat a eucalyptus yeah, leaf exactly. and not die exactly. or, or suffer severe problems. But yeah. koalas and those plants have developed a, a synergistic behavior, but no other animal on the planet can eat a eucalyptus. Same thing for for probably um, bamboo leaves and, and the pandas. You know, it's... So all those plants out there, they're rooted in the ground. They can't run. They can't fight. They can't bite. So they develop chemicals to protect themselves. And the parts of the plants they want you to eat, you know, if they want you to take their fruit, eat it, and run around and poop the seeds out somewhere else, they'll make it appealing for you. That's why I think fruits are are better. Right. 
but they don't want you eating their 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 roots, their leaves, their stems, the parts of the plants that are reproducing. So they they have lots of chemicals. Tomatoes used to be poisonous. There's, it's a nice shade. The only reason we eat tomatoes is because we've out we've bred out the the toxin. Yeah. So you know, a hundred thousand years ago, if someone ate a tomato, they would have died. Yeah, it's crazy. Probably, it's so. crazy because there's still a lot of stuff that you even if you do try to consume now, you have to cook it down, right? Yeah, exactly. Like there's a, like root, potato. root vegetable, you know, yeah, a carrot, eat, a potato, you know. Eat a potato without cooking it, and it'll give you severe GI distress. Yeah. So I mean, some people can tolerate it based on their thing, but yeah. So the more I've just listened to my body and eliminated the plants, the more happy my gut has become, and I think the happier I've become. I'm getting to the point where now. I'm pretty much a steak eater, fish, chicken. I try to get organ when I can, liver. Yeah. Um, that's the primary organ, but, you know, force of nature makes a product with its liver and heart mixed in with ground beef. We try to eat that one. And now Hop Dotty just opened last night. Yeah. And they've got force of nature on the menu. For I didn't meat. know that. I didn't know that. I knew that they yeah. had purchased out or bought out grub, bought and out I've grub. been wanting to try it, but I didn't know they had that. But that's you awesome can, to hear. You can get their, it's the bison burger, whatever it's called. Uh, I I forget what it's called, but they've got the Force of Nature um, ancestral blend in there. Okay. Belief, so yeah, I want to try that because I yeah I mean I'm I'm more and more and I'll, I'll shift focus and I do a first off I I'm always low carb because anytime I eat any carbs I'm just I feel like shit. Yeah. Like I mean the only thing it's I can tell sluggish and gassy every single time even if it's gluten not way. even like even I've cut gluten first but then still it's still yeah. you know even when I'm consuming like a a handful of rice or something, you know. So I, I just prefer to get my carbohydrates if I get any from from natural um, sources, fruits. Yeah. yeah, fruits, and I still eat. You know, I get my fats mostly from nuts. But it's funny how like you talk about anyone will have this argument with you, and for the longest time, people would preach, "Don't eat a lot of red meat." Well, I'm, I'm on the advert of that because like I get most of my fats from beef, and I still eat pork. You know, I'm not yeah. eating bacon, but I'm yeah. eating like a uh, I do a lot of barbecues, like a cooked down, like you know, pork shoulder or something like that that has good fats in it, and and it's just meat is not bad for you, right? It's, it's the most ridiculous argument ever. It, now, if you're grilling it and putting this char on it, you know, maybe you're creating carcinogens in the in yeah. the char, but red meat is not bad for you. The animals, animals eat other animals all over the planet and have for eons. It's not bad for you, but you mentioned nuts. That's one thing I've personally gotten away from. Really, that's interesting. Because yeah, last time we because, talked, because of all the toxins yeah. in the almonds and the, and the cashews. You know, cashews are highly poisonous unless you specifically treat them. Um, they're they're not good to eat right off the tree. Right. And a lot of nuts are, are highly processed, and they a lot of nuts contain a lot of oxalate. Yeah which is also an irritant and leads to kidney stone formation. And since I had made kidney stones in my life back when I used to eat like crap and drink Coke every day, <laughs> I, I'm trying to avoid the oxalates and also trying to avoid it for the gut health. Yeah. I remember, I remember you mentioning so, that with, um, especially with almonds and like almond milks. Last time yeah. we met, we we're talking about, you know, I believe it was Lipton. Uh, uh, was it Lep- 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 I don't know. It was something that, that was inside of almond milk that you said was bad. I can't remember exactly what that, yeah. what that was, right. but, um, Either way, yeah, like I, I do Lec- like lectin. Lectin. Lectin is a general term for like gluten mm. and other irritants made by plants. Got you. Okay. That's so there are a lot of lectins in almonds and and um, you know I used to eat a handful of mixed deluxe mixed salted nuts. Yeah. Every day. I mean, I have for a long time, and I've just kind of gotten away from that now. So. That's interesting because I still do that. <laughs> yeah. But now that you said that, I'm going to get away with that. And honestly, it's it's uh, it's a combination of. Uh, Almonds, uh, pecans, and cashews, um, yeah. which I prefer. Honestly, I prefer pecans. Um, I, I do enjoy I think those. pecans are the – and I looked it up. I looked it up saying, well, God, do all nuts have oxalate? Yeah. And pecans, it's uh, pistachios and pecans are at the bottom of the list. Well, those are the – my pro- um, honestly, those are the predominantly the and, ones I prefer. And macadamia anyways. nuts I think are the best. Okay, okay. But macadamia nuts – and they're the highest fat, so that's yeah. really the best nut to eat. High fat, low oxalate, but you just can't eat many of them. It's just nah. – there's something about them. I mean, they're – they were good when I used to eat macadamia nut cookies. But, right, exactly. But, but when you just eat a handful of macadamia nuts, it's just, it just yeah. tastes like something you shouldn't be eating. Yeah. Which is what the plant wants. It doesn't want you eating its nuts. It yeah. wants its nuts to go into the ground. You know, there was a, a comedian I saw, or I think, or it might have been a um, a guy who was uh, just an influencer talking about how plants don't want you to eat them, who said, 
Oh, it, it was. It was McAfee. You know, okay. Have you seen him? Yeah. Um, he's yeah. a carnivore guy. And yeah. He's the one that gave that talk this year at the at one of the conventions called Plants Want to Kill You. Mm-hmm. It's a great YouTube watch if you want. He said, you ever seen a kid eat br- uh, Brussels, um, Brussels sprouts? They taste like shit. You know, yeah. they, the, that taste is that plant's way of telling you, spit me out, don't eat me. You know, and kids know this. Yeah. Human uh, adults just... You know, try to find ways to convince themselves that it tastes good, but I hate those things. <laughs> and macadamia nuts the same way. I just, when you eat them, if you try to eat them like you would a handful of pecans, they just don't taste good. Right. So. Well, yeah, I've gotten towards like, I, honestly, I love like, I've gotten to where I'm like peppers and meats. Like yeah. I love like a, like, like a poblano or something like that. Yeah. But I, I mean, yeah, man, I, I feel like the best you can do is just try to avoid as much as you can. But like, it's but still you know, those peppers are some of the worst things. I know. Too. They I know. don't want you eating them. Either. I know. That's why they. That's why they're spicy. That's why they're, they're so spicy. Yeah. I know, man. They want like, animals to spit them out. Yeah, it's a battle. It's yeah. a battle. Like I just, I feel like you know, I just try to, you know, I try to do the best I can. But I, I think that's fair. I mean, yeah. I, I don't tell everybody, look, never eat nuts. Never. Right. Yeah. If I'm talking about patients, I just want them to get off the process. That's the hardest thing, right? Because get every, off the processed crap eat natural foods and then you can find what works with your body. Yeah. You may have problems with oxalates and I don't or vice versa. You may tolerate peppers. If I eat a lot of peppers, I get GI upset. Yeah. That's who doesn't. That's mm-hmm. part of what the peppers doing to you. It's saying, "Hey, look, don't eat me again." So, um, you know, I I avoid lots of peppers, but I've I like gotten, spicy food, so I'm kind of in a... I'm the same way. Like I can't do certain things. I can do a poblano cuz it's not too spicy. It's just the taste yeah. I like, but like I just had recently, I had an um, operation where they had to go in and scope me and stretch my esophagus because mm-hmm. I had the, uh, I'm sure you know what the term is, but basically where the your esophagus shrinks over time uh-huh. based on hereditary issues, possibly past tobacco, you know, smokeless tobacco use for years, yeah. and then um, constant uh, acid esophagus. reflux. But I basically, um, they went in and stretched it. A, a piece of meat got stuck in my throat, and it was in there for a long period of time. And wow. then the first time this happened previous years back, we got it out. You know, I went to the ER, but by the time they got to me, it finally pushed its way through. Mm-hmm. Over the years, it's happened multiple times. And then here recently, like six or eight months ago, it happened, and it never came out. And mm-hmm. so I had to go get emergency scope to get it pushed through. And then we did a follow-up and had to go in there and actually stretch, you know, yeah. stretch that out. And then um, – so now it's like, man, I try to, I just, I'm really, really getting more health conscious. Yeah, chew really my well food, too. not inhale it. Cause I was, those people like, I, I guess cause we worked at oil and gas for so long. It's like you had a short period of time to eat a lot of food and you just inhale it. Yeah. And now it's like, I, I take my time to, to get the food down and I'm worried about more about what I'm eating now and you know, how it's breaking down on my body. Well, that's the way, I think that's the healthy way to do it. I mean, start by eliminating the processed food, sugar, yeah. seed oils. I'm big on seed oils now. That's, yeah. I mean, those are those are horrible. They're so you say us. just right, yeah, like because they use that shit to run motors and stuff on, right? Yeah, like I mean, it, that's the original solution. They were originally industrial lubricants. Yeah. Until someone said, "Hey, I wonder if you can eat these," and they started processing them and mass producing them during the First World War, I believe, around that time to replace fats that they were taking and sending off to the yeah. troops. But um, you know, it's start there, eliminate sugar, processed foods, seed oils. And then see what works for your body. If you if you like eating potatoes and broccoli and it doesn't cause problems and you're not getting obese by eating too many of them, then more power to you. Yeah, it's something, man. I, I don't I don't stand on any mountain and say it's the only way to to do it. Just everybody needs to find for themselves. Yeah, I think, but you you really can't become body aware until you cut out those bad oh, things. Yeah. Like when you cut out the processed stuff, then you kind of it's like you slowly get a feel for your body because when you when you Exactly. If you're off those for a while and you put them back in, you feel like shit. And you're like, holy shit, I see what it's doing to right. me. Yeah. But you have to be off of them long enough to, to kind of, I guess, like reset. It'd be kind of like trying to listen to a really intricate piece of music like Beethoven or Bach at a at a heavy metal concert. Yeah, you know, as long as those speakers are blaring, you're not going to hear anything else. Yeah. Um, but once you cut out the noise, you can start to listen and hear what your body's telling you. But the seed oils and the sugar and all the other crap that we're eating uh, in the modern industrial food supply system is is just making so many people into walking zombies. They just don't really know what it feels to feel normal. I agree, and then and that creates like also like your your body yelling at you and creates more. I I feel like this is connected to you know these 
anxiety pandemic or everyone has, Absolutely. you know, and the issues with, you know, just everything internally too. It's got to be connected, mm-hmm. right? You know, it's over Absolutely. the years, it's more like you're, you're we're consuming more stuff on a mass level that we shouldn't consume, and then we're in a um, high stress environment you know, mentally, and then you're putting your body in a high stress environment and then the combined, you know, creating and our jobs. A exactly. lot of times or, or, or I see a lot of guys who come into me and say, I just don't have any energy. I feel like crap. I think I need testosterone. And I start talking to them. They're eating fast food every day. They're working the night shift. They yeah. get like three, four hours of sleep during the day when their kids are coming in from school, waking them up. Yeah. You know, they're drinking, they're not exercising. They're obese. I check their fasting insulin, and it'll be off the charts. So they're insulin resistant on the way to diabetes, and they want to blame it on low testosterone. Yeah. And I was like, look, let's address all this other stuff first. Yeah, everyone always wants and a quick solution instead of you know, going to the, the root of it yeah. because it's, it's, it's work, <laughs> right? It's work. The frustrating ones for me are, like I told you, that my friend uh, um, who I just got through talking to a week or two ago who's doing everything right yeah and his testosterone's still low i you know i can't figure those out i don't i don't know what to do about that so you know you hate putting a 30 something year old guy on testosterone the rest of his life but it makes him feel better he's doing everything right i'm going to support him but if some you know guy comes into my office and just wants the quick fix i'm going to be I'm going to push back. Yeah. I mean, if you don't want pushback, don't come to me. <laughs> yeah, you're not I'm the guy writing tests. Test, uh, yeah, I'm script. not just script writing. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, not a, I'm not trying to make money writing testosterone. Yeah. I'm trying to help people. So if you don't want pushback and you just want a quick script for testosterone, don't come see Dr. Siskron. <laughs> so what it, So how's that look lately? Because, like, um, or I, I, let's, let's push towards that side of the conversation because like there's so many people out there that, that suffer from um, low testosterone and, and I know we're hitting the nail on the head talking about, you know, <clears throat> the number one thing with that is probably, you know, health, unhealthy habits, right? Yeah, yeah. Unhealthy living habits. And, but also like, you know, where, where it goes from, you know, people maybe having difficulties um, with energy, you know, or, or maybe, you know, reproducing or, you know, how, how does all that look? What do you mean? Give me a little more specific. Okay, so like, so let's first go into like people running. In qu- you just hear more and more people on TRT, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and is that something that they need to be on, or people just prescribe this, and then once they're prescribed it, they yeah. have they have to be That's, on it? I, I think most, of, I think a large amount of it is is stuff that we're doing in our society. Yeah, and and you can, I think they've pretty well proven that are as a society, our testosterone levels are dropping. Yeah. And I think it's due to a lot of things. Like we discussed all the, the the estrogenic compounds in the plastics, particularly if you cook your food in plastics, it leaches out those estrogenic compounds. Water bottles. Um, Which I apologize, by the way. <laughs> lack of sleep. Yeah. Um, lack of getting sunlight. You know, we're as a society, we're told to stay away from the sun and, and um, you know, working night shifts, and you know, some people hardly ever see the sun. You check their vitamin D, and it's low. Yeah. I just had my lab checked about three weeks ago or so, and my vitamin D is lower than I want it. It's like, damn, I need to get out in the sun more. But it's kind of hard in the winter. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it's. I think if you eliminate the seed oils from your diet that allow your cells to be healthier, you're going to be at less risk for. For cancers, there's some good research on that too. And that's so that you don't burn. Yeah. If you eliminate seed oils really? from your diet, you know, um, there's a lot of people who are, if you look into that, that are really showing good evidence that y- your propensity to get sunburned is less when you eliminate seed oils from your diet because our cells are made up of fats and those fats from seed oils, those polyunsaturated fats are much more sensitive to oxidation and damage from UV light. They're going to break down. There's many more chinks in the armor of those polyunsaturated molecules that have kinks in them. Whereas if you've got a saturated fat, it's it's much more rigid and it's, it's going to hold up better to all stressors, including UV sunlight. Yeah. Well, I think like you see, seed oils are hidden in everything. Mm-hmm. And if you really don't read the label, like oh, I mean, I mean, hard. how many things do you you, you can't they, get away they from make? It. Like it's like anything that's in a bag or a box, like yep. sunflower oil, grape seed oil, yep. you know, whatever, whatever, what have you. All the other, all ones. the condiments, yeah. Every well, I saw you, uh, you made a post the other day on social media and um, on your Instagram, I believe, and um, 
you took a picture because you you work in you know the medical field. You took a picture of you know a vending machine. Oh yeah, yeah. and I don't remember on the pediatric ward. I don't remember what your specific. You can tell me what the specific comment was there, but I just I was like, this is going to spark a great conversation. What I said, about. and and I was seeing a, a, I was seeing a four six year old boy up there, um, and uh, I walked out the door, rounded the corner, and right there in the middle of the pediatric ward, where all the kids come in and out of the rooms and run on the parents, a huge vending machine full of every bad snack you could want yeah. from the Cheetos and the Doritos down to the, to the candies. And then right next door was the, the vending machine for the Coca-Cola and the Powerade I'm sure had full of sugar in it. Yeah. And my comment was one day, I hope that seeing a picture of this is going to look as strange as if it would seeing a picture of a cigarette machine sitting there. Yeah. You know, it. remember when we were kids, when I was a kid, at least, Cigarette machines were everywhere. I remember seeing them even up until yeah. You I'm, go into yeah. the, you go into the pizza restaurant, mm-hmm. cigarette machine. You go into the arcades, cigarette machines. You go into the movie theater, cigarette machine. Where are they now? Yeah, we figured out cigarettes aren't aren't good for you, people. Yeah. So we got them out of our society, at least the visible pushed sale of them. Yeah, and my dream is one day that looking at one of those vending machines, particularly on the pediatric floor of a hospital is going to be looked at just as, is amazed that it's even there. Well, it's awesome that we, we, you bring that up and I thought it was a great point too. And it's one of those things where like, it's so interesting to me how so many people in your field of expertise do not highlight Health. Anything to do with health and yeah. diet, you know, more, yeah. you know, it's just more about a quick solution or writing prescription, moving well, them it's, on it's for volume. Unfortunately, you know? a, a, a symptom of the of the system we're evolving into. Yeah, you know, you do the math, and it really, it's hard for a physician to keep the lights on and make the living that they want to make. I mean, I didn't go to school till I was 36 to make, you know, 10 bucks an hour. If I want to do that, I can go to target and sweep the floors. Exactly. And make 15 an hour. Yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> you know, I want to have, um, it's not the reason I went into medicine. There are people I'm sure that do that. I was going to be an engineer and I went in, I was going to engineering until I got a side job in the hospital and learned to really love helping people. So I think I went into medicine for the right reasons, but I also enjoy having the higher standard of living that it affords me. And I'm not going to do this job if it, at the end of the day I'm making the equivalent of 20 bucks an hour. I'm going to go find something else that's productive that I can make a better living at doing with my intelligence and my drive. Yeah. Um, having said that, I love helping people, but you know, I can't keep the clinic operating if I see 15, 20 patients a day. If you work an eight-hour day and, you know, you're there eight hours, you see two patients an hour, that's 16 a day. You see three, that's, you know, 24. How many, when does it become profitable? And, and a lot of these clinics, you know, it's you got to get down to seeing more patients per hour in order to make it profitable. Yeah. And to be able to maintain the standard of living and keep the lights on, it's amazing to me how much I see my bottom line every month at the hospital. And I don't manage my own. It's managed by the hospital. Right. I'm an employee, but I see the expenses. And I was like, how on earth does it cost this much to keep this clinic operating? It, before I get paid a dime. Yeah, right. Before I get paid a dime, I do the, the calculations of how many patients I have to see a day. And it blows my mind. That you know, you got you got to see so much just to keep the lights on. Right. When, when you when you take into account the cost of medicines, the cost of staffing, the cost of the rent, the cost of the lights, the cost of um, the OSHA oversight. I mean, all that stuff adds up, and it's so expensive. And the regulations, the same with any business. Mm-hmm. You know, these business owners are getting killed with regulations yeah i mean and I, i'm seeing it now because me and ken sanders yeah. and grayson bailey are doing the uh the venture we're doing with the exotic car storage place yeah i heard about that and That's it's exciting. amazing to me how much it's costing just to oh, get man. this off the ground yeah man it depends we, on we're redoing the we're redoing the building to make it look nice redo the parking lot we wanted to cut out the curbs so people with nice cars can drive in without scuffing their car and because we wanted to eliminate that little curb that touches Ellerby Road, 
they had to get a permit from the Department of Transportation, Federal Department of Transportation, which was going to put us on like a three-month waiting list and cost us something like $100,000. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much it was, but it was, okay, we'll leave the curbs. Yeah. You know? <laughs> one album's cut out, we'll leave the other ones. Right. So, I mean, there's just so much red tape and regulations. It, it getting, I've never owned a business of my own or really been involved. I've always been in medicine. Yeah. And, and seeing all the things that go into doing a business, the the taxes. We just got our tax bill for the building. Like you know, we're gonna have to come out of we're gonna have to come out of pocket for taxes yep. now. You know, cause we don't have any renters right now. And it's just amazing the the regulation, the taxes, the the foot of government that's sitting on the U.S. population is just keeping us so suppressed. It's it kills me how yeah. profitable and how productive we could be if the government would just get the fuck out of our. <laughs> I, hate, I agree. No, hate, I, I I'm becoming agree. more and more of a Bitcoiner, by the way. Too, <laughs> I think Bitcoin's going to save the world and get I fiat mean, money out of our system. That's what it seems. That's it seems to be like yeah. If we ever get that, you know, digital currency, but it's there's yeah. There's so many issues and regulations with um <clears throat> with everything with every type of business, and it's it's been that way since. I it just can keeps getting remember. worse. Yes, it's worse and worse. It and it's like worse. the more you do something, the more that process is prolonged. And it's like, but also at the same time, our patients, our actual patients, you know, with each person is also diminishing daily too. It's yeah. like, it's like everything's taking longer for progress, but then internally we're also not willing to deal with that, you know. Um, we're becoming more isolationist yeah. and less community right. oriented. And social media is driving that a lot, I think, too. Yeah. You know? I, it's just... We're not built – I had this conversation with someone the other day, but we're not built to communicate in a mass level. Yeah. We're built to you know, formulate our own cultures and live within there, those cultures. There's a, there's a term – there's a number. Some guy's, the, some guy's number. It's a name, number. It's like 200 and something people mm-hmm. is what the human is able to remember and function with. Yeah. Small communities. Yeah. I forget the name for it, but it's, it's – a. It's a factor. You know, it's kind of like Moore's law with computing power. Gotcha. It's something law or the something number where human beings are are able to keep up with and be friends with and remember uh, relationships and and live in small groups of about 200. Yeah. When you start getting beyond that, we lose the ability to do it. So yeah. we, we shut off. You know, it's no more face-to-face. It's through, um, you know, I don't care what this person thinks or feels, you know, screw them. Yeah. You know, and you just lose the personal connection and going global is just making it worse. You know, we're losing that community oriented thing of our, of our parents and grandparents. You know, my, my mom grew up in Tallahassee, Alabama, which, you know, back when she was a kid probably had, I don't know, 10,000 people in that 10,000 people were probably grouped mainly in church groups. Mm Mm-hmm church and school groups and you know it was out in the country and you know you people shop together in farmers markets and you, you knew your neighbors and we've just gotten away from that and i don't think it's good for the human condition no i mean it's i mean it's the writing on the wall right and you know people want to argue it may be this or that but i mean when you put so many people into one system and then try to First off, no two people are ever going to see eye to eye, too no matter what. Competing. There's too many people with too many different ideologies mm-hmm. competing together. And then if that person doesn't like the other person's ideology, then they attack them instead of trying to come to a resolution. Right. And when you're doing that at scale, there's no way to, besides just shutting someone off, like what you know it seems to happen all the time. There's no way to regulate it because yeah. there's just too many. There's too much clashing of the you know the irons basically. So it, yeah, it's just an, it's a whole shit show. And I completely agree. And I just try to be aware of that and like at this point it's like at this point in our lives what can we do to control it other than not contribute i guess you know so i try to be aware of that and have more conversations like this and actually really get to know people you know not formulate an opinion based on a one post or a fucking yeah. you know clip of something you know and i think it's important to find your community that's what exactly. i love about crossfit yeah. i know yeah. you feel the same way oh yeah man crossfit is a community you're in your box and you know everybody you support everybody they're there to support you yeah you you have your Christmas party with them. I mean, you same thing. Church. You got your church community, CrossFit community, your work community. Humans need that community spirit, and I try to block out as much as possible all of the international or the national, international, world crap. Cause yeah, we 
can't solve all that. They're trying to make the United States follow the same rules and 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 morals as some country in Africa or Middle East or Asia or wherever it's we're never going to be the same. No. And and attempts to make us the same are just forcing us apart more. Yeah, there's so much it's coming to a head. There's so many wedges driven between every single community now and it and it's like it's if you're in your own community you're almost segregated at the same time looked at and hated by others when mm-hmm. we're I feel there's a fine line between, you know, completely detaching from everyone and trying to integrate, you know, all these cultures. You got to find some kind of, you know, yeah. balance there. But um, CrossFit, man, yeah, let's talk about CrossFit because I've been, I've gotten way more into it what, since two last CrossFitters, time. <laughs> we had to talk about CrossFit. Yet? Not yet. We're talking about other shit. But oh, so I've gotten really into it since the last time we sat down and um, y'all put on a phenomenal, phenomenal competition because I've been to a couple smaller competitions mm-hmm. since. But Wad Gods was amazing. Yeah, I think I placed. To make it right. We, I think I placed like third to last in my entire class. But I'm okay with that. We had fun. Yeah, I, I was I was competing higher than I should have been at a level. But I, our our goal has been not to make money. We've all lost money on it. Yeah, I, I, I'm still in the red. But <laughs> every dollar we get in goes into making it somehow better next year for the yeah. athlete because we're all athletes and we want athletes to come to Wad Gods and feel like. Man, this is pretty awesome. I feel yeah. like a, a star. You, know? you can see it too. I mean, from yeah. all the way down to the detail. I mean, the details of the, the how every single thing is entirely organized, like phenomenally organized. There's no, there's no, literally. There was you no, saw how stressed I was. With yeah, my I mean, of course, I man. mean, trying to keep everything. But on there's track. no hiccups. There was no hiccups. Yeah. Nowhere. Everyone ran through their courses. Everyone did everything. I never saw a delay anywhere. Yeah. You know, and it's hard at that. And how many competitors? Did they you were have? there, but I, yeah, you knew them, but yeah. oh, we didn't. So yeah. how many competitors were there? Uh, this year we had a, less than the year before. We had a little bit of dip this year, but I believe it was two hundred and something. Okay. Last year it was three twenty. Okay. And then this past year, it, it was in the 200s. And uh, this year, we're scheduled to be, I believe, the last weekend in August. Okay. Uh, I'll look at the date so I can say it on on air. Yeah, I mean, it, I just, I was extremely impressed. And also the... The, um, the, 20, the weekend of the 26th, 26th and 27th of August. 2023. 2023. Right. Yeah, I was just, I liked that the variety of the... Um, the variety of the work of the wads, mm-hmm. but also that every single one of those integrated some type of weight, you know, well, you, you, balance you, with, you'd really appreciate how we do that. And, and Ken really drives this too. Um, he has this sheet of all the different movements that you can do in a CrossFit workout, basically. Yeah. And of, uh, in the different, um, categories like gymnastic movements, weight movement, uh, endurance movements. And we literally have a scattergram picture of the wads to make sure it's evenly distributed yeah we don't want it all up in the gymnastics area or all in the heavyweight we want it evenly distributed and make it a good test of fitness for some big guy to come in there and kill the weights but he's gonna he's gonna get hit on the on the bars you know that's what that's what happened to me (laughs) and it's just my gymnastics aren't there yet but they've evolved quite a bit since then at that time i could barely do um i believe it was handstand push-ups man i just I didn't have them down yet, you know, as far as like being able to do a, yeah. a bunch at one time and it just completely ruined my time. And then I also sucked at toes to bar or chest to bar or whatever, you know, just because mm-hmm. it's not, not that when people hear that and they hear, well, that's because you have that argument and you've seen that argument yeah. where it's like the chest to bar is not the same as a pull up. No shit. It's, it's about being efficient because here's the thing. If we're out somewhere, say we're actually in, in war or combat or something and we're, we're endurance pushing ourselves to move and jump over barriers and pull up and jump, you know, get over obstacles, a strict push up, a pull up's not going to help mm-hmm. you much, you know, mm-hmm. but being able to actually kip. efficiently mm-hmm. kip yeah. and not use as much, utilize as much, I mean, use more as much energy and be efficient and know that how long you could last, you yeah. know, Instead that is one out. of the most ridiculous arguments. People who hate CrossFit oh, I know. say, oh, y'all are kipping pull-ups. That's ridiculous. You're no. not getting anything. They're hard as shit by You can't try to do it, number one. They're, they're hard. And number two, <laughs> we do strict pull-ups. Yeah, we do those too. We, it's not like we don't do them. Right. It's just the strict pull-up is your strength movement, and then and you shouldn't try kipping until you can do strict yeah. for at least 10, I think, because there's some shoulder strength issues there that if you try to kip, it's going to rip your shoulder out. But – you know, you get your base, and then you start learning efficiencies and how your body moves. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, animalistic like movements. That's uh, something I've been looking into a lot lately. Uh, and you see a lot of jujitsu people into this also. I know you do that is, you know, how does the body move efficiently yeah. and fluidly? And that's all a kipping pull up is. It's, it's moving efficiently and fluidly. You're, if you want to look at it as work, the definition of work on a physics basis, it's the same amount of work. You're moving this much mass, this much distance, and this much time gives you power. You know, we're we're exploring the power aspect mm-hmm. of of the body and lifting rather than just the pure work aspect. Yeah. So, you know, we do work. We move 300 pounds, two feet. Right. But we also do it powerfully, yeah. moving it fast and efficiently. And being able to do that for an extended period of time is a different skill. I mean, since my neck's been hurt, I haven't been able to do like uh, a lot of overhead weight stuff. And I tried the other day, we had, we had a workout, um, it's 20 burpees, um, 12, no, it's 20 burpees, 21 alternating overhead dumbbell snatch, and then 12, um, thrusters with okay. the dumbbells dumbbell thrusters yeah and i it was supposed for males rx weight was 50 okay i haven't picked up a 50 pound dumbbell in a long time because you know just right it's either my elbow or my neck and you just tweaks but uh, i went to 35s and i was like i'll be able to do this with 35 and i blew through that first round in three minutes and 20 seconds. And Jeff Dixon was telling us at the beginning, you know, to finish this workout in the specified time of 14 minutes, you need to be doing each round at about four and a half, um, 420. Right. So you had a good time then. So yeah. I was like, man, I blew that out of the water. Yeah. And then I just hit that hit wall. wall. <laughs> I was like, jeez. <sighs> yeah. And I started to get down to do the next burpees. And then my neck started hurting. And that was enough excuse to say, look, okay, I can't do this. Yeah. But I'm just out of shape right now because I've been favoring my neck and, yeah you know and people say yeah you're doing crossfit and hurting yourself well that's that's the next thing i was going to bring up like so what's These your are all injuries i've had my whole life right yeah what's your what's your um your comment there because there's so many people that they say like what's well, yeah. horrible on your joints it's not good for your body long term yeah. um this like bro- running is exactly yeah exactly these people who love to run you yeah. tell me you show me a group of runners that don't have achilles tendonitis and right. plantar fasciitis and um, you know, everything else, what's the one on the front of the shin splints, yeah. knee problem. I mean, triathletes. Knee problems are a huge one for those. Triathletes are always complaining of somebody. Being an athlete exposes you to injury yeah. and, and being a CrossFit athlete is. But you, you got to be smart about it. And it, you know what's the worst injury? It's sitting on your couch eating crap, getting obese and sick. Exactly. You're going to pay the price – either along the way as you're staying fit with athletic injuries or when you're getting your heart cath and your dialysis with medical injuries. Yeah. And you're going to pay the price one way or another. Right. You choose which pill you want to swallow. I'm choosing the be active, deal with aches and pains that are an inevitable part of being a human being. You know, we're fragile organisms. I, I had elbow tendonitis for a long time that I nurtured and it's now better so I can use it. But now I've got this pain in my neck, which is from a prior injury. My hip, I found out my hip arthritis the first year I started CrossFit. So that was obviously already there. That was from triathlon and an injury. I think I had when, when I was in a car wreck, uh, you know, my ACL repair was from when I played baseball, you know, in, in football in high school. You know, that wasn't CrossFit. Right. But all these things affect my ability to CrossFit now. Exactly. And they all cause me to be smart. And, you know, if my knees are hurting one day from my ACL repair from when I was 21, I don't heavy squat. Exactly. If my neck is hurting me, I don't go overhead. You know, but you you just work your way around it. And, and that's, that's important, too, because I think once you become... There's so many people who just listen to your body. Yeah, exactly. You become body aware and you learn what yeah. not to do. And that, what I love about the sport is, you know, I was a long time Olympic and more bodybuilding lifter. I never competed in bodybuilding, but I, I was more that tiles style of lifter, um, you know, b- on top of like MMA. And, and it really didn't work well because you get so bound up and then you're not limber enough to do certain movements. So yeah. my jujitsu was never amazing, but my mm-hmm. stand up was great because 
I didn't need to be doing specific movements. It was just more power movements, right? And so then we go to this thing. And so I've been having to basically reshape my entire body. Like, so I, people are like, you look thinner. I'm like, yeah, but I weigh the same. Yeah. My muscle, like the way that I'm moving redistributes. Different. Yeah, redistributed my weight. My my muscles are functioning better. I'm stronger. I'm strong. A stronger squat than I've ever had. A stronger deadlift than I've ever had. You know, way stronger cleans and presses than I've ever had. But I'm not just stationarily doing like bench press or something because mm-hmm. I've I detached my pec tendon eight years ago now and like so I I make sure that I'm not stressing that ever because it's always in the back of my mind and then I've had issues. Like I had, um, I feel like I had tendonitis, like you were saying, um, a few months ago. But I, what I love about CrossFit is that you can, want, you, you become so body aware. There's so many different workouts that you can still be, stay active and progress on other, you know, in other movements while it's always also something to get better at. Yes, while yeah. also nurturing, you know, an injury, which yep. is awesome. So that's why you always see a CrossFitter, no matter what. They probably have an injury because they're always pushing and themselves, but they can work around it. You also avoid injuries of life. Yeah. Because your whole body is prepared for life. You know, um, there was something we were doing. The story I always tell is I was helping um, to helping my brother move a bunch of um, uh, concrete bags. We moved like 80 concrete bags, maybe 100 for my dad one day. And we had to go to Home Depot, load them up, take them to the truck, put them in the truck, drive home, load and load them from the truck. And the next day or the day after, he was telling me, man, my back's killing me. Is your back sore? And I was like, my back's fine. I, yeah. I don't feel anything. And I think I moved, I know, I moved more of those bags than he did, faster than he did, because I, I turned it into a CrossFit workout. Yeah. You know, and I was, I was having fun with it, you know, enjoying my functional fitness. But things like that, you know, I, I know what it was. I was, I was coming down um, – off of a step and I lost lost my footing and I caught myself in that deep one-legged squat <laughs> you know you're about to fall on your ass but yeah. you catch yourself yeah. and I stood up I was like wow that was close kind of like a pistol or something exactly yeah. Yeah. you fall into a pistol and but I came out of it as a close how many people rupture their their patellar tendons doing that yeah Bill Clinton being one of them he was coming down the sharks you know what's his name's the 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 uh, golfer yeah coming down his steps and slipped and ruptured his his tendon um people do that all the time when they lose their footing and go to catch themselves that tendon isn't prepared for that immediate force and it ruptures and you know had i not been doing crossfit no doubt in my mind i would have ruptured something but i was able to catch myself and you know if if i someone told me the other day um in one of my patients they fell they fell and and broke their uh, broke right at the head of the humerus. They had to have, well, there's a surgeon in town who fell and had to have that reverse um, socket surgery. Oh, shit. Yeah, they they yeah. put the socket on the, yeah. on the humerus and the ball hits weird, reverse shoulder surgery. Just because he fell and put his arm out. I could fall 10, 10 15 times here and catch my full body weight on this floor and not break my arm. Yeah. But people who aren't protecting their bodies by keeping their muscle mass and their bones strong, if they fall, they got to worry about fracturing something. So, yeah. you know, I'm not worried about falling. I fall on, I fall and not worry about it. You know, unless it's some freak accident thing, but you know, just slipping and falling and rupturing my Achilles tendon or my patellar tendon or fracturing my clavicle. That's not going to happen. Yeah. No, I mean, it's I'm just, very proud of that as a CrossFitter. It's something that, that's not spoken about enough. And honestly, it's just, there's, it's a different community. Um, I've enjoyed it because it is something that every person in that room, if they are doing the workout with you, they are pushing their body to their limits mm-hmm. and respectively knowing what their limits are. That's the important yeah. thing because I've seen so many people subsequent to injury because they don't know what their limits are and they try to jump in and he man and it. try to follow you exactly. I mean, someone comes in and tries to press what you're pressing they're gonna hurt the, i'd right. hurt myself well i mean so. and the, it, but it, and you see that in injury in a regular gym too where someone yeah, try yeah. to jump in and then they're out mm-hmm. for two or three weeks because they tweaked something or broke something or tore something and it's it's that's always going to be there but i do I do just respect that everyone's in there killing themselves and they're battling with their own demons mm-hmm. and they're, you know, push at the mental, the mental uh, warfare of it on top of the body, you know, the detriment to the body in a good way, like pushing it to, to, because 
people don't do that anymore, yeah. right? Unless you're just an athlete, and even an athlete, you know, there's still that's all they do. There's but no like physical stressors anymore, right? Like I was watching something on Instagram, just one of those funny scrolling, and there was two obviously obese guys who were getting ready to get in a foot race. Mm-hmm. It was at work, and there were guys standing around videoing, and they got in the foot race and they take off, and one guy lost his momentum and face planted because he's too front heavy and the other guy comes up holding his hamstring yeah i was like i saw that coming from the very (laughs) beginning their bodies were not ready to sprint in a race but you know you and me could go outside right here and probably sprint right now and we'd be fine yeah because we're used to work yeah and that's what that's what the beauty of of constantly varied movement at high intensity of crossfit i love it man i'm just i'm ate up with the bug and it's so funny because i was involved with it you know when it first kind of hit the hit the scene and we were doing a lot of mma stuff and there was a crossfit gym next door so we'd we'd go work out there and do some of the workouts but i really wasn't into it as much because i was doing too many different things mm-hmm. so i wasn't really focused but now that i'm hyper focused on that I didn't understand it as much right it's taking the it's taking the um that's pretty much all i do these days competitive wise so that kind of has taken the reins but it's just something that um, I encourage everyone to try, you know, um, but not to go out there. And, you know, the great thing about it is everyone can do the workouts. You just scale the weight, you my know, mom, my scale mom, the movements. My 78 yeah. year old mom is doing, she's oldest in our gym. That's she amazing. does workouts. That's amazing. So man. she'll tell me, Oh, I did really well in the workout. What was your score? And she's like comparing scores that's, with me saying, Oh, amazing. I did this many reps. How many did you do? You know, if it's deadlift, I'm doing hundred. 85 for reps. Like last night I did 185 for reps. She might do 45 for reps. Right. Who knows? She's still doing it. But she's scaling it for her body and her friends, if they fall and they're going to break their hips. If my mom falls, she's going to stand back up and keep walking. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the beauty of it. No matter what your age. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's just so life preserving. I think. I agree. I think it's awesome. Getting in the lifeboat. Yeah. What do you, what you mentioned? You're on the uh, pediatric level. What, what are you doing? You're seeing you have pediatric pa- patients yeah, for it urology. Was, it was a child with. Uh, uh, I was on call. Okay. And it was a child with an infection. Okay. Um, so that yeah, this raised yeah. alarm to me. I was like, okay. I mean, how how often do you see? Let's talk about this because this is something that's extremely usually important. with a pediatric patient. It's like for a child, it's a torsion. One on call when your testicle twists on its blood supply. Okay. And it's kind of an emergency. It's one of the urologic emergencies. You have to do surgery to untwist it. Whoa. How does that happen? Um, it, you know, when your testicle forms in utero, in, in utero inside your body uh, while you're in utero, it's right before birth or right after birth that actually drops out of the abdomen. Okay. The testicles form analogous to the ovaries. And the blood supply comes from the kidneys, up near the kidneys, from the, um, the renal artery or the IVC. And... So your blood supply down to your testicles is very long, and you just like it's hanging on a on a stalk. And there's a specific deformity that they say makes it more likely to happen. But basically, the testicle can just twist inside the scrotum. Damn. The, okay. So this is so just early development issues. Then it right. usually happens uh, very early on or around puberty. Okay. Uh, are the most common Damn. times for it to occur, and. Um, you know, it may be due to a lot of times they'll relate it to an injury, you know, a football accident, or it may be related to self exploration. Yeah. You know? Kid twists his testicle, doesn't want to tell his mom, hey, I was playing and just twisting it, yeah. and now it hurts. You know, so that may be children when they go through puberty become more aware down there. Um, boys, anyway. Um, so that may be related, but it, it's. It's usually around puberty, and about two weeks ago, I had to go in at 3 a.m. for a 12-year-old boy who had torsion. Okay. And uh, untwist it. So when they know, is that something they just ex- experience sharp, it, sharp? It becomes very painful. Yeah, yeah okay. very painful, and they usually speak up and see say, that. hey, something's going on. We need to. Yeah, yeah. and they okay. go to the ER and, uh, and get an ultrasound. It shows no blood flow to the testicle because it's so twisted and swollen at that point that there's just no flow to it. So you got about six to eight hours to untwist it. Or it's or it's permanent issues. Mm-hmm. Damn, permanent that's loss. insane, man. That's insane. Mm-hmm. What about um, uh, kidney stones? I know that's something that so many people experience. Yeah. And we're and, seeing it younger and younger. And due to horrible, horrible it's diets, diet. not enough water consumption. Like, what are your oxalate, thoughts on that? High oxalate, number one. Uh, nuts, chocolates, um, dark leafy green, spinach, things like that. Strawberries, they say have a lot of oxalate. 
Um, but it's all plant foods. There's no excess oxalates in meat. Yeah. You know, but um, oxalate in the diet, which a lot of times we get it in processed foods. Um, I believe sugar is a major contributor because of the metabolite uric acid that is downstream of, of fructose metabolism. Uric acid is produced, which not only raises your blood pressure through inhibit- inhibition of nitric oxide synthase, it also gets secreted in urine and forms a nidus for kidney stone that then calcium and oxalate can bind on to. Uh, excess calcium in the diet is a risk factor. Excess salt, which is really big in our diet, can be a risk factor if you're met- metabolically unhealthy. I think being metabolically healthy, I can eat all the salt I want. My kids just pee it out. I've noticed that too. You know, ever I since, actually love eating extra salt. Well, since I've gotten and you need to when healthier, you're, yeah. I'm the same way. Like I yeah. used to be low sodium everything because I was scared of how, how bloated me, and I knew it was bad for you yeah. if you're in. The, but I was also drinking every single day, even though I was eating healthy and working out. I wasn't in my pinnacle, you yeah. know. Of if, if you're healthy, if you're metabolically healthy, your kidneys do the job. They they get rid of the extra salt. The problem is when you get rid of extra salt in your urine, a lot of times calcium gets drug along because there's a, a calcium sodium channel that shares passage of those two um, materials. So excess salt can bring excess calcium into the urine. Gotcha. Um, and then that calcium finds the oxalate that you ate with your nuts and connects together yeah and forms the first little crystal and once that first little crystal forms and it attaches right under the mucosa inside the kidney um it just next time you do it it grows and it grows and it grows and it can be over a period of many days months weeks whatever years those stones grow but it's it's a diet thing yeah i think stones have been with us forever but i think uh, if people ate healthier diets my job would get a lot less necessary in terms yeah. of stones and everything else. I, I've never had them, but I, I'd had them um, at one time back. And we might have talked about this years ago whenever we were last time we met. Um, but I had had back pain and I went to visit an orthopedic doctor thinking it was a muscle issue mm, or something. Yeah. Something yeah like and that. then it ended up being, you know, ketosis, basically uh-huh. early stages of it uh, because I was consuming so much proteins and not enough um, liquid. And, you know, yeah. as far as not enough water and um, yeah, but, I just think it is interesting that something that you deal with, I'm sure, on a daily basis, and people just, like, it's always interesting to me when people complain about having it, but they're the people who most of the time are unhealthy. I know sometimes they say it's hereditary. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but... Anything's hereditary. Okay, got you. And the way I say about that, and I, I have to push back on this with diabetes every time I talk to somebody. Oh, well, it runs in my family. They're, I hate And what they're say saying that. when they say that is, oh, there's nothing I can do about it. Right. I say, well, you know what? Alcoholism runs in my family. I, I can list five or six people in my extended family that are alcoholics right now, two of whom are dead because of it probably um, from liver failure and other causes. But I'm never going to be an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. And I can say that with pretty damn certainty. And why is that? I always ask them, why do you think I can say that? Because I don't drink. Yeah. I rarely drink alcohol. I mean, I'm not saying I never do. Right. But I do not drink alcohol to the point where I'm going to be an alcoholic ever. And diabetes is in my family as well. My grandmother had diabetes. I think both of my grandmothers had diabetes. Um, And I believe at least two of my aunts have diabetes. So... Um, diabetes runs in everybody's family, but you do not have to be a diabetic if you don't express your propensity for diabetes. Now, one family is going to have a different propensity for diabetes than the other. Just like your fasting insulin, when you're eating a really good diet, it's going to be different than my fasting insulin. Our pancreas will respond differently <coughs> to, to, to bad diets. Yeah, Everything's hereditary, but it doesn't mean you have to express your your... Um, you don't have to pour gas in the fire. Exactly. <laughs> so if you eat a healthy diet and avoid all the processed food, I guarantee you, you're not going to be a diabetic. And if you eat a good uh, diet, I can almost guarantee you, you're not going to have kidney stones. Yeah. You know, I had kidney stone when I was uh, 33, my first one. I was a third, I think I was third year um, resident in urology. So I knew exactly what it was when it hit me. But at that time, I woke up in the morning and went to work, 
and got a 16 ounce Coke for breakfast with my breakfast, which at the time included grits and toast and jelly and waffles and syrup, pancakes and a bagel with cream cheese. I mean, I was a carb loader because I was a triathlete. I thought you had to eat that way to have energy. Yeah. Um, so I had a horrible processed carbohydrate diet. But it also was very high in Coca-Cola and oxalates. <laughs> so I'd drink a Coke for breakfast. I'd get a Coke about mid-morning, top it off. I'd get a Coke with lunch. I'd, I'd get a Coke when I got home in the can. And when I was in the Air Force, driving to work in the morning, I would fill up my 64-ounce Coke, sip on it throughout the day, and then fill it up on the way home. I drink 128 ounces of Coke a day. So all those years through my 20s and early 30s, I was forming kidney stones. And I still have a few teeny tiny ones in my kidneys, but they haven't grown in 20 years now because I'm smarter with my diet. Yeah, that's something that people just don't think about. Yeah. I, I really Everything think Everything comes down to diet. I, I know, doesn't it? And no one wants to admit it. Yeah. Like no one wants to admit it. And they are they or it's what what's so fascinating to me is we have all the answers. Yeah. But we don't do anything about mm-hmm. it. But then when there are things that we don't have the answers to, people put more expiration and energy into. And it fascinates me because you know you're dying. You know you're dying every single day, and you're expediting that process. Yeah. But you're not like you're – it's like you well, don't want to admit it to yourself. Look at what we've just been through the last three years. I just saw a post also that says it was – there's it's it's going through the, the rounds, you know, like the same overlay of, of – the voiceover and different people are posting it, but there'll be people working out and it'll say, just think of all the lives we could have saved. Have we been putting as much energy into telling people that COVID-19 doesn't kill you if you're metabolically healthy? Yeah, exactly. If you eat right and exercise, you don't have to worry about it. You're not COVID. a candidate for dying. You're not a disease. candidate for death. We're not saying you're not going to get it. Yeah. But we're saying you're not going to die. Instead, they're telling people, Oh, put your mask on, stay indoors, you know, do this, do that, get vaccinated, which is just it annoys me to no end that our our Louisiana Department of Health just recommended vaccines to 6 month olds. I didn't know. These vaccines are causing so many cardiovascular problems and Well, let's 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 other problems. let's say this. You're not just just to be clear so there aren't any questions here. You're not saying you're against vaccinations as a whole. No, you're saying no, no. you're against this vaccination. This because, one, I believe, yeah. is causing a lot gotcha. of harm yep. more than it's causing benefit for a six-month-old baby for sure. Yeah. And there are other countries around the world that are starting to to ban the vaccine for anyone under 50, I believe. And there was just a, a hearing in the Senate, Senator Ron Johnson, last week, if you can look it up. It's on Rumble. They don't have it on YouTube, of course. <laughs> um, but go to Rumble and look up Senator Ron Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine update uh, hearing and listen to all of these world-renowned scientists who have been just lambasted over the last two years because they're saying real data. Mm-hmm. The number of the percentages of heart problems, percentage of, unnecess- of uh, excess deaths uh, in the military – the medical system that they track injury and, and illness is just skyrocketed over since 2020, since the vaccine. There's so much evidence that there's something going on that our government is not coming clean about. They just keep pushing this vaccine. And we need, we need more open and honest debate about it. And we need all of that data, a lot of which was in that hearing, to come out into public so people can – start shedding the light on it and deciding if they want that vaccine or not. Yeah. I personally am not taking it. Yeah. Uh, And I all day long will tell people if you eat right and exercise, you don't need the COVID-19 vaccine. It's not protecting anybody else around you. It's been clearly proven not to stop by this point. Most of the people who are in the hospital and dying are vaccinated at this point. So, um, and there's evidence that they're actually getting it at a higher rate Mm -hmm. because it's hurting your immune system possibly. So, I mean, I'm not saying I know all the answers, but I'm saying there's enough evidence out there that it's doing some fishy stuff that we need to look at it a lot closer before we start mass recommending it more. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's something, it. it's something that's been interesting and, and it's, it's, it's like things that were said are now being recanted. Yeah. Right. And that's, yeah. that's happening on a weekly, 
or you know monthly basis yeah. at least. But it, that's not going to be broadcast yeah. as much because no one wants to admit they're well, wrong about that. There's reels on on in, Instagram where they've got all the compilation. Get the vaccine and you will not get COVID. Get yeah. the vaccine and you cannot transmit it. And yeah. I'm not saying that anymore because yeah. people are getting COVID with the vaccine, having been boosted three or four times, and they're transmitting it. They've got higher viral load in their secretions. So, I mean, it's a shit show, man. It's a shit show built it around is. it. But I think that um, – I, I just think – I'm glad that you're, you know, someone who likes to push, you know, onto your patients and into the, to the mass, like to, to just – to, you practice what you preach, of course, mm -hmm. so then you can be an expert. At, because there's a lot of – there's also a lot of physicians that are out there telling people that they should – have better lifestyle, but they're not living yeah. a good lifestyle, you That's know, true. to, to be they're someone human too. Yeah. I mean, to be someone to recommend something, I feel like you need to also be, if you're doing it yourself, then you're, I mean, why not mm -hmm. listen to someone who knows what they're talking about? You know, you know, Jordan Peterson. Yeah. Have you read his book? No, I'm not. First one. No, I'm not. E or listen to it, read it. I'm a whatever. listen guy for it's sure, but yeah. excellent one. It's yeah. excellent. He has a chapter in there about how we treat our dogs better than we treat ourselves. And people will spend ungodly amounts of money making sure their dogs have the right pills and the this, that, and the other, and they'll make sure they take them. But their doctor gives them their blood pressure pill and says, uh -huh. it'll sit on the counter. And he goes into the whole explanation of why that is self-loathing, mm -hmm. the human condition, you know, it, it, what am I worth saving type thing. He goes into all that. But, you know, it's true. We don't take care of ourselves. you, you got to love yourself to take care of yourself. And a lot of people out there don't love themselves yeah. enough to do that. I agree. It's, it's sad, but it's true in modern society. What are than. your thoughts on sucralose? <sighs> I, I have a problem with it the same way I, you do. I know. I, I know. Monster I know everything. It's, in, it's Here's my thing. It's like there is no healthy <clears throat> option that – like yeah. if they take sugar out, they replace it with sucralose, yeah. Yeah. and then it's like shit, man. I, I don't think, know. I don't know if it's good or not. I think there is plenty of evidence to support that sucralose does a couple things. Number one, it disrupts your normal GI flora, your gut flora, um, and number two, it can mess with your insulin sensitivity, um, making you insulin resistant. Everybody's going to be different. I, to this point in my life, have not had enough GI issues, having eliminated all the other stuff that used to cause them, with my monster every morning yeah. to make me want to say, my gut flora needs to be protected. i got to stop that. Now, if I were having gas and bloating and pain every morning after I drank my monster, I would put two and two together and stop it. Um, I had my fasting insulin checked three weeks ago. It was one7 What's the normal levels for 5 that? 5 to 25 is the stated normal. So 1.7 is like, means my pancreas pretty much shuts down when I don't eat. Okay. If gotcha. I don't eat for eight hours, my pancreas is dead to the world. Got gotcha. you, got gotcha. you. You know, I am not insulin resistant. I, I can, a little bit of insulin goes a long way in my body. So, um, you know, that hasn't driven me to stop my monster habit either. Right. It's just... And, and I'll admit, it's a habit. It's, mm -hmm. it's my one little vice I like. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I don't do marijuana. I don't do THC. I don't do all that. But I like my monster in the morning, damn yeah. it. So we all have a, we all have a vice. We all got something. I, yeah, I mean, I, I drink. Um, I enjoy if I'm getting any caffeine. And I'm not – I'm so – it's very interesting. And I don't know if you've experienced this. But since I have – gotten more cleaner and cleaner even since i met you i'm hypersensitive to caffeine now yeah. where i used to not because i think i was pushing my body too hard every single day uh -huh. that i was relying upon it so i was using it to fuel me past my you know um mm -hmm. way past my strain point and also this thing right here i've been i've been wearing the whoop strap i've only probably wasn't even wearing it when you when i met I'll you last you were, but yeah. i am become on point with my recovery my strain what i should be doing i know i still enjoy my tequila from time to time probably more than i should but i it's okay it's not a it's not a daily habit yeah um i can see my recovery the next morning and don't even tell this thing i'm wearing i don't tell this thing anything i'm not inputting any data but i wake up the next morning with the same amount of hours of sleep and the same strain and i had can see. and i can see the recovery has dropped down 20 to 30 percent because i put that in my body and um, now I don't feel any different, but my body, my body's mm -hmm. doing something different, right? And I, I, I've noticed that with caffeine too. Whereas I don't, 
require as much or does it this one can will last me all day long like whereas used to i could knock two of those things out a day which is insane to even think about you know what the worst part about it for me is, is i used to drink them later in the day yeah i quit doing that because it makes me get up now yeah night to pee yep <laughs> I, caffeine never in my whole life has bothered me i could drink a monster right before going to bed sleep like a baby but you know now with my neck issue disrupting my sleep to some degree um, I'm trying not to do caffeine in the afternoons yeah. and because I don't like getting up to pee. And if I drink caffeine, even tea, Oh, you're going to get up at 3 a.m. I'm going to get up. Yep. Yes. It's, it's, it's inevitable. <laughs> it's know, like a, my bladder at 53 is not as happy at 3 a.m. as it was at 23. Well, uh, you can, you can probably answer this question cause I always heard and I've never looked at any science behind this, but I just, as I've gotten older, I always listened and paid attention like, that you're not supposed to hold your pee, right? It's not good for your bladder to do it. Yeah, I mean, to some degree. Well, I try not to, man. So if, I don't, yeah. if I'm in a position to use it, I'm not going to hold it. Um, but, you know, when you're younger, and even I've been guilty of just telling the kids that, but you have kids, you, you'll you tell them, oh, you'll be all right, hold it. Well, that may necessarily not be a good thing. Yeah. I don't know, you know, but I always was wondering about well, that. The, the reason it's not good to hold it too long, I think, one of the reasons is because it's a muscle, right? And any muscle is stronger when it's partially contracted. You put... 100 pounds in your hand here, you're going to be able to move it more effectively than here. Got you. Because the elongation of the muscle, those myofibril connections aren't as strong. So as your bladder distends, those attachments get stretched. And if you get it too stretched, you're going to get way out there on the tips, and you're not going to have a very effective contraction. So you're going to get to the point where you're not emptying your bladder well, particularly as a man as we age or prostates get larger um, and more obstructive, you get, you don't want a weak bladder against an obstructive prostate. So keeping your bladder empty more is going to keep that muscular contraction more effective as you age. And is that something too? We haven't even brought up a yeah, prostate cancer. Is that something you're seeing more and more of, or is it just? You know? I don't know that I'm seeing more of it, but it's definitely prevalent. I mean, yeah, they say studies show that if you live long enough as a man you get prostate cancer you just autopsy studies in 90 year old men shows about 80 percent of them i think have really? prostate cancer so of course not all of them die of it and most men don't one in eight get diagnosed i think in their lifetime but um it's definitely there and i think it is also diet and nutrition related and that was my next question you know, what do you think's driving that 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 to you know to ex- expedite that process i guess yeah chronic inflammation i think drives a lot of cancers but it's a metabolic disease i'm fully convinced and it your metabolic health matters and if you're diabetic which the diabetes instance is going through the roof now you're going to have your immune system not as as good your bladder's not going to empty as well because of neurologic damage to your bladder. So you're going to retain urine. Your prostate is going to get more inflamed. Um, chronic inflammation sets into the prostate, and cancer eventually develops. So I think all of the metabolic disease and the chronic disease in general in society is driving driving a lot of cancers, whether it be breast cancer or GI cancer or prostate cancer. I think a lot of that has to do with our lifestyles. Yeah. Well, it's just like, so it's the, the big question is where do you draw the line, right? We're, we're such a huge capacity, you know, as far as population, we have to mass produce things. Mm -hmm. So it's like, what corners do we cut? You know, we can't take it back a hundred. If we had the knowledge we had now and we'd go back a hundred years, we would be way more effective. Right. But we can't do that. So it's like, where do you draw the line? You know, it's so hard. The cat's already out of the bag. Yeah. And a lot of things. Yeah. We're never, I don't think we're ever going to get rid of seed oils. I mean, it's just too. They're everywhere. It's too ingrained in our society and too profitable. Yeah. And now with the, what is it, the ESG movement, the, the climate alarmists wanting to get rid of cows, you know, as if the cows are the problem. My, yeah. My, They're trying to push us more into agricultural thing. Uh, food sources, which is what's destroying the planet. Yeah, we're disrupting the natural ecosystem. Yeah. You you walk into, and if you go to the Force of Nature website, they have some videos on this. You go into a farmer's field that's plowed and stand on it in the, in the sun and feel the heat coming off of it. And then you go to a pasture full of cows and look at all the carbon that's in that ground that the cows have sequestered. Yeah. Cows are carbon sequestering machines. That's yeah. what they do. They eat grass and um, 
and poop it out into the ground and develop topsoil. That's what topsoil is. It's carbon. And, you know, our ag- agrarian society, we've released all the carbon out of the ground into the atmosphere. And there's some studies that show we have a limited number of cycles left on the harvest in our in most of our farmland before there's no no good soil left. I believe that. I mean, I think that uh, at it's some point you're going to getting blown off to the winds yeah. and, and you know, we're releasing the carbon back into the atmosphere through our farming practices, not through raising cows and eating meat. I mean, that's, that's something not, I mean, we have like it's something that I just do I cannot get on board with the vegan thing or the vegetarian. I just can't get on board with it. I can, you know, I, you have to have meat. I don't give a shit. I will never. Yeah. I'll never like not argue that. You don't have to have it. You can right, live without right. it. Yeah, you can live without it. But, but it's not the optimum. You're not going. You're not going to be at your optimum. Uh, yeah. You know, performance and state. Any vegan who wants to argue with me, I will. I will eat my words. If we go camping for a month in Northwest Louisiana, you pick the location. Neither of us take any food. Into the, into the wilderness. <laughs> That's another thing. And let's see how yeah. long your vegan survives. It's an it's environmental woods. thing, right? So there's always something around that's um, walking, moving, or consuming that you can eat mm-hmm. no matter what environment you're in. Whereas if you're in a you certain environment, plants. you can't just eat something in the wild. So t- then you're telling me, so we've developed, yeah, we're like, well, we're at a point in society now where we, we have the ability to, to move that to us, right? To ship that to us or whatever. You can't carry your Brookshire's produce section into the woods with you. Exactly. That's, that's the stipulation. Exactly. And right. it's, 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 we, you cannot get that. Like, I, it doesn't matter where I'm at on the planet. Even if I'm in the Arctic, I can find an animal co- to consume. Exactly. But you cannot do that and with And those plants. are some of the healthiest people on the planet, the Arctic uh, oh, yeah, Inuits. Yeah. They eat nothing but whale blubber and, and fish and fish yeah. oil. Yeah. And that was one of the original pioneers of the carnivore diet. Sir, what was his name? It was in the early 1900s. He got stranded in the Arctic and had to live with the Indians for uh, the winter and ended up staying there for a year or two and was writing in his journal how amazed he was that they never ate bread. They never ate vegetables. They didn't even know what they were. They just ate animals and fish and drank oil and they're the healthiest people ever and he came back to new york and they admitted themselves to a hospital um for a period of months and had this well-conducted scientific study on them eating nothing but meat and they their health markers for the time were perfect but this has all been lost in in history because seed oils came into and then agricultural and it's just this industrial complex monsanto and all of that suppress it and now the save the planet crew is on to this animal meat's bad for you and they're trying to make us eat fake meat which thankfully is tanking you see yeah, yeah. saying beyond meat is like losing its its shirt yeah so that's that's good but. yeah i think it's something that's an issue and i, I mean the thing is, is like it, it there's good and bad things to mass communication. The good thing is, is that we are finding out information. Mm-hmm. We're able to share it with each other. Like we're doing here, who knows going to listen to watch this and, and talk about those things. And whether you agree or not, you're at least getting the information. Yeah. Then you can divulge it. However you like to. Right. Whereas before you were just told something. And if you were never outside of your box, that's all you ever knew. Yeah. So it's like almost like ignorance is bliss, it's bliss, but also, you know, at the same time, it's not, it could, you know, disrupt your entire life because you don't know. You know, it's like you, you're you not worried about it because you don't know about it. At the same time, it could shorten your lifespan 20 or 30 years because you never knew anything otherwise. Yeah. I wish I could go back and take all the seed oils that I ate in my life. I wish I could go back and take all the alcohol. Oh. <laughs> 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 that and, yeah, a lot of that, man. I, I haven't had that problem. Yeah. But, you know, I had some definite discretions diet-wise. I've always been pretty active, but I just had a crappy diet for the first half of my life. Oh, I did up until I was probably, honestly, up until I was probably 18 or 19, I did. I did. And then, you know, I kind of started turning it around slowly in my early 20s. And then I'm still, I mean, I'm still working on it, but I will tell you just in the past three or four, five years, I mean, I, it's been amazing what I've, you know, figured out about myself. I have to throttle myself back with my sons because, you know, we want to yeah, help the ones yeah. we love and, you know. I, they always hear me preaching, and I send them things on social media and all. But you know, you, you got to live. But you, I also want them to understand how unhealthy all the crap out there is, and uh, it's a balance. That's how we are with the kids, man. I, I've just I've taken I've taken gluten pretty much out of the 
it's not, I don't care if they have it at their grandparents or whatever, but it's not in the house. Yeah. You know, it's not in the house. Dairy's not in the house. It's, aside from using the occasional, occasional cheese, you know, on something, mm-hmm. um, it's not there. Um, you know, I'm just big on the meats and we still do some green vegetables, especially for them. I think it's better than consuming a bunch of bread anyways. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, um, but yeah, I think it's my wife gives me shit. She's like, you, you're healthy, but sometimes I, I think you have an eating disorder because you worry too much because I still count my macros only because now I'm just hyper focused on getting enough protein, you know, and also not getting too many carbs because you if you don't watch it, you could you'll take fucking 200 carbs in and not even know it. Mm -hmm. You really will. I mean, especially if you consume something other than, you know, a a soft drink or anything, you know, all kind of juices, anything like that processed stuff. So that's I try to really watch that. And like I keep my fats Right now, I'm at a. Um, this is what I'm at, and I don't suggest this for anyone. But I like, I stay if I'm if I'm on a training day. If I'm I'm training that day pretty hard, I'll get about 250 grams of protein. I'll consume about 125 to 150 grams of carbs, and then anywhere from 80 to 100 grams of fat. And then, alongside that diet, your sugars really aren't that high. You know, if you look at your and macros, your carbs are not processed carbs. No, they're, they're not sugars. So they're, they're typically you know they're carbs from you know yeah. fruit. You know, or if I may have some potatoes or something rice like that, your something. rice, yeah. Um, and then on non-training days, I take the carbs down to 60 to 75 and my protein a little bit lower. To and like you're aware 200. of the trick that doing those carbs post-workout are a little bit healthier for you than pre? Yeah, yeah. Because um, there's an argument there. Some people say otherwise. You're but a little bit more able to uptake those carbs into your cells and use it for what you want to use it for. Um, you don't need the insulin as much, so you're more insulin sensitive post workout. That's what they say. Yeah, you, you want to you want to take those in right then because yeah, I mean that's. There, I know there are people who say you got to preload, but I, I don't believe in that. I think, I used to do, do both, you know, and I like think, I don't now. I don't preload. In. Honestly, I just it depends on the day, um, but I definitely know I'm taking in more carbs that day anyways, and I'm taking more protein too. I guarantee you, if I were sitting in front of a carb athlete and we both had to get up and get on a bike and ride for five minutes i would have just as much blood sugar in my blood Mm -hmm. just as much glycogen in my muscles for the first five minutes of exercise um you know the difference is going to be as a more fat metabolizer that gray period um where i run out of glycogen and and that takes a pretty good amount of calories i think it's like 2500 calories of glycogen and that's a lot so that's not five minutes it's not 10 minutes but there's going to be some point in there where there's a transition where the carb athlete if they're sitting there taking goo is going to have a little bit more energy than i will um but i'm going to I'm going to overtake them at some point unless they keep doing the goo. I'm going to be able to go. Right. And I proved that when I did my 100 mile bike ride a few years back without eating anything. I can just go like an energizer bunny, um, long, slow distance. Now, hard effort. You burn through all of your your immediate sources of fuel and then your glycogen, and you keep going hard. You're going to need to replenish. Yeah. Um, the the fat's going to have a harder time keeping up in a hard effort that's extended, but who does hard efforts extended? Except for maybe the CrossFit open athlete. I mean, the CrossFit right. um, games yeah. athletes. Yeah. I could see an argument to where they're doing five workouts a day, really hard efforts. They're burning a lot of calories. Mm-hmm. They may need to have carbs more readily available than I would. Yeah. But you know, that, they're pretty specific. I'm still group. trying to figure it out. I think it's, I think it's something that I do. I, I, an advocate for knowing your body and then every single person is different Mm -hmm. Um, because I've seen people who things affect them that don't affect me and vice versa. But I do know that I feel 100 times better on a more fasted approach on a daily basis eating. And then also working out fasted, you mean, or that, well, yes, like of course that, but also like, you know, consuming my consuming, like almost like a uh, intermittent fasting too, consuming my, my food in a, you know, eight, eight to 10 hour window. Um, and then also taking, you know, any type of those carbs out the complex, you know, just more meat based. I mean, honestly, I just feel better. I will lose some weight. It's going to fall off. So if you're going to be a mass, you know, you're worried about your mass, you're going to lose 10 or 15 pounds if you do it uh, initially because you're shredding off inflammation first and then fat a lot know. of that's water weight yeah. and fat yeah. yeah and so i haven't noticed that my strength got any yeah worse yeah to, to a significant degree until i quit lifting my strength 
has diminished some because my weight has diminished some. Like yeah. right, because so you like you can only hold up so much if you're you know how depending on yeah. how dense you are. But that's the only reason. But it's a lot. You know, I went from 240 pounds to 215. Mass, so, mass. of course, I'm going to be a little. I, I, I realized that while I was actively Olympic lifting more, like three days a week, I was obviously stronger. My snatch was 205. My clean and jerk right. was 265. Now I could maybe snatch 185, 190, but I'm not lifting heavy all the time. That's I'm just still, doing, I'm doing the, low, the lower weight, higher intensity. How much do you weigh? 185. Yeah, I mean, it's still a great amount. I still amount snatch of, you're snatching body your weight, yeah. body weight. I mean, that's that's yeah. in itself very good, you know, where it's like, I mean, I got a um, 275 power clean the other day, and I was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. You know, I thought that was great, but also it's you awesome. can't do that shit every day either. Yeah. Like, it's like, that's like you pick and choose. Like, it's like if I can just PR once a month on something, I feel like I'm making slow progress, yeah. right? And now I'm more getting into the, the overhead squat stuff and not pushing up, falling forward on my toes and trying to, you know, trying to. I haven't got a muscle up yet. I'm working on, I'm getting there, yeah. you know, and skill work It's still working on some gymnastics stuff, man. It's just, it's a constant battle, but it's always something, there's always something you can get better at. Yeah. And then you can double down on that once you do, you know, it's like, okay, now how do I get, I got this movement down. Now can I get stronger at that movement? You know? Yeah. We reached the end. I mean, no, we're not there yet, but I mean, we can wrap it up, man. We're pretty, we're over an hour now. Um, yeah. Any last thoughts? No. Just know your body. <laughs> yeah. Avoid the avoid the processed food stuff. Uh, that's about it. Anything, Unless any, you want to start talking about Bitcoin, then I can go on. Man, we'll save hour. that for about another that. one because I'm not I'm I'm not well versed on that yet. I'm I'm read the seventh we, property. Okay. Listen to the seventh property. It'll, it'll open your eyes. Yeah, we're tiptoeing in that. I have I have some friends that are very very hardcore into it. You learn about what money is why humans even have money and what it has been over the centuries and then why our money system's broken now and why it's going to continue to break. And, uh, the seventh property is a great book to explain that. It'll get you, get you in the door. Interesting. I mean, Hey man, I'm always open. I'm like always open to opening warm wormholes that I'll just yeah, fall down well, into. And then <laughs> it's a huge, one. It's a huge well, one. We'll wrap it there, man. It's a, it's always a pleasure. I'm glad we got to catch up and, yeah. uh, we'll see you next time, man. Hey, man. All right. Good talking to you. Yes, sir.